Wondering if you could have a seat right here. Uh, good morning. You are juror 87, is that correct? All right. I'm going to go through a few things before I turn it over to the attorneys. The first of which is to uh, swear you in because all your answers have to be under oath. So if you could raise your right hand. You swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that you will truthfully answer all questions regarding your qualifications to serve as a juror. I do. Okay. All right. Um, you're fairly soft-spoken, clearly. Um, and we have to make sure that you're heard. Uh, we have plexiglass in front of the lawyers, plexiglass between us and plexiglass in front of you. And I'm going to continue to wear a mask, even though I've had one shot so far. Uh, I think it's appropriate that we take all the precautions we can. But uh, given that level of precaution, uh, you may, if you wish, re remove your mask if you think it will allow you to speak more clearly or if it's just comfort. Okay, and if at any time you want to put your mask back on, feel free. We won't take it as an insult or anything okay. like that. Uh, basically, you're in control of that. All right. Um, you filled out a questionnaire, and I appreciate that because it gives a lot of good information for us to start with. Is there anything on, well, first of all, is that questionnaire true and correct? Yes. All right. Any changes or additions that you want to make to the questionnaire that you can think of right now? I can't. Okay. Uh, it's very common that uh, in the months since you filled out the questionnaire that you might realize on reflection that I should have added this or I should have talked about this okay. or that was inaccurate. I need to make sure they change that or maybe your opinions have evolved. So okay. uh, when the attorneys are asking you questions, they'll probably be more specific and zero in on certain questions and answers, and even reading them to you and your answer to refresh your memory. Okay. What I want you to understand is that it's all right to say something different than what's in your questionnaire. That doesn't get you into trouble because, like I say, on reflection, certain things uh, need to be changed, okay? okay. All right. Uh, the questionnaire also advised you not to read any articles, avoid the media about that. Uh, but again, it's been a few months. Uh, this case continues to receive media coverage. And we understand that inadvertently jurors may have been exposed to some, like a headline or a blurb on the news that they can't turn the channel off quick enough. Mm -hmm. Anything like that? Did you learn any more information about this case or any related cases uh, since uh, you filled out the questionnaire? Only... Um number of jurors that had been selected when I was running through my news feed okay. last week. Have you heard anything about um, any related litigation, civil cases, anything like that? No. Okay. Any, like any settlements or anything like that? Have you heard anything about no. other cases? Okay. No. All right. Uh, sounds like you've been able to pretty much keep yourself away from the news. <laughs> trying to. Okay. <laughs> And that's all we could ask for your best efforts. So, all right. Um, you know something about the case uh, from prior media before you filled out the questionnaire, before you were summoned. Uh, and the lawyers will probably go over that a bit. And you may have even form some opinions about things, about the people involved. And the question I have for you is, as a jury, you have to decide this case just on the evidence you hear in the courtroom not on what you've heard outside the courtroom or on opinions you formed outside the courtroom. Let's be just focused on the evidence and to follow the laws I give it to you. Do you think you could do that? Yes. Okay. Uh, you were given a long list of witnesses. Uh, did you recognize anybody on that list? Donnie Chung. Okay. Uh, and how do you know this person? He's a neighbor. Okay. And what does that person do? I think he works for the BCA, but I, I can't re really remember. It might be FBI, something like that. Okay. Uh, lives in your neighborhood? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I'm not sure what that person's role is. Let's assume that that person actually is a witness, because the list of potential witnesses is long. Yeah. Um, if they do testify, can you treat that person uh, just like any other witness, yes. apply the same standards. Yes. Uh, if you disagreed with their testimony and didn't find it credible, could you 
go back to your neighborhood and uh, if you saw that person not have a problem dealing with them? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, we estimated the trial length at four weeks. It sounds like you could make that work with your personal and professional life. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a yes? Yes. All right. Uh, the other thing is the court reporter is taking everything down, so we have to deal with yes and no quite a bit. Okay. You have one very good habit, though, is you don't talk over uh, the other person. The <laughs> lawyers and I are probably the worst offenders at doing that, but you seem to not have a problem doing that. And that's very good because, again, we can't have people talking over each other because it makes for a bad record. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, unless you have any questions for me, I'm going to turn you over to the attorneys. No can't questions? Think of any. Okay. And just to maybe be a little closer to the microphone, uh, okay. as to juror number 87, Mr. Nelson, you may inquire. Good morning, ma'am. Morning. Thank you for your patience, for being here yesterday, and uh, for returning this morning. I'd like to ask you um, a series of kind of general questions, get to know you a little bit better, and then move into some of your responses to the questionnaire. Would that be okay with you? Yes. All right. Um, so let's assume that you and I were to meet under a much different circumstance, a party or a social event or a neighborhood gathering. Um, would you, uh, what would I learn about you during that conversation? I'm married, I have five kids, I stayed home and raised them all. Okay, yeah. and they're all adult children now, I yes. believe? Right. Um, wonderful. And are you from Minnesota originally? Yes. All right. Uh, you obviously were familiar with, um, before receiving this packet, you were familiar with the circumstances kind of surrounding this case. Is that fair to say? Yes. Um, it was kind of hard to avoid it in the cities at that time, wasn't it? Yes. Um, when you received this packet and you learned that you were a prospective juror in this case, what was your first reaction to that? Uh, I was a little nervous about it. Okay. And, and why? Well, I knew it would be a high-profile case. I knew the city, you know, kind of blew up after um, the incident happened with Mr. Floyd, and I just was afraid of what might happen being part of the trial. Okay. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. When you say you were afraid of what might happen, are you talking about your personal safety? Or are you talking about the the city again? What do you mean? Um, both, but more that anybody being on a jury or involved with it might um, have a little bit of a reason to worry for their privacy and their safety. Okay. Um, well, let me ask you this. When you came downtown yesterday mm -hmm. and saw the state of the government center, how did that make you feel? Um, I had seen it before. I knew that it had been um, fenced off and wired in. and Mostly it just made me feel sad that we're kind of in this state. Sure. Okay. Um, did it alleviate any of your concerns for your personal safety while we're in the trial? Yes, it did. Being, I feel like the building is very secure. Okay. And in terms of, in terms of um, yesterday when the judge kind of gave the initial instructions that we're trying to protect your anonymity, um, not putting you on camera, not referencing you by name, things of that nature, how did that make you feel? I felt that that was um, reassuring. Okay. Yeah. Now at some point, and again we don't know when or under what circumstances, but your name may be released to the public as a juror, if you mm -hmm. were to say. Um, how do you feel about that? That makes me nervous. Okay. And are you concerned, I mean, you reference kind of privacy and safety concerns. Yeah. If you were to sit on this jury, would you be sort of hyper-focused on those types of concerns that it would distract you from listening to the evidence, focusing on the evidence, and ultimately deliberating and potentially reaching a verdict? I don't think so. Okay. Would those concerns influence or influence any decision you may make at the end of the case because you want to avoid, you, you think that one vote may help you avoid uh, physical safety or, or you know, 
keep you safer. Can you can you repeat that? Yeah, I, I apologize. It was <laughs> That's a very. Okay. If you were, if you were in the deliberation room, and there's two potential verdicts, right? right. Guilty or not guilty. Right. Would your concerns about your personal safety um, influence your decision about guilty or not guilty? Do you think that no. you would be safer if you voted one way versus the other? Right. I understand. Um, it wouldn't influence it. It would not? Or? It would not. Okay. Right. Ultimately, you would be able to listen to the evidence, listen to the testimony, look at the exhibits, and render a decision based on the evidence as it's presented in court? Yes. Okay. Now, um, have you uh, either, well, I mean, with five kids, I'm assuming at some point there were some conflict between your kids? Yes. <laughs> Um, and as their mother, you were called upon to resolve that conflict. Yes. How do you approach that from the context of conflict resolution? Try to seek out the matter and what happened, what the facts were, and um, what the reactions were, and who might be right and who might be wrong. Right. Um, there's a it's fair to say that there's a significant amount of conflict in this case, right? Yeah. There's obviously a very big conflict, which is State of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin, and then there is potential for conflict within the jury deliberation room. There's 12 people who may have 12 vastly different interpretations of what they saw and heard during the trial, right? Yes. How do you, how would you envision yourself approaching that type of conflict within the jury deliberation room? I would try to listen to what everyone is saying, try to understand their point of view, and make the best decision that I could. Okay. I don't typically like conflict, but... <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. But obviously, I mean, this yeah. is, this is a, a situation where conflict may abound. Yes. You, under, you understand? Yes. Um, so the question becomes, you know, you say you don't generally like conflict. If you're in a room and you feel that, you know, you have made your mind up one way or the other mm -hmm. and others disagree with you, are you the type of person who is going to abandon your position simply to avoid the conflict and gain consensus? Or are you going to kind of stand your ground and say, no, I am standing by my conviction? I would stand by my conviction. Um, again, in your personal or uh, professional life, um, have you been called upon to kind of de determine which, per whether one of two people is telling the truth about a situation? Yes. <laughs> again, with your kids, I'm assuming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Yes. And maybe with kids it's a little easier, but how do you approach, you know, you're going to hear witnesses in this case, right? And you're going to have to, your job as a juror is to assess their credibility. Is this person telling me the truth about X, Y, or Z? How do you assess a person's credibility? That's a hard question. Um, on out of any context, just well. I mean, I guess in in the you, let's just put it back into the context of your kids, right? Okay. Two kids come into sure. you to say to you, "This is what happened," and one says X happened, and the other says Y happened, and you know your kids. How do you how do you assess that situation? Um, I look at the past history of my kids and generally how I know their behavior is, um, try to understand the situation leading up to a conflict. Okay. So kind of gathering more information, yes. would mm -hmm. that be fair to say? Yes. And um, what if other people saw that same incident? Would you go to other people and ask them their opinion about what happened? 
Yes, I would try to get all of the information that I could and okay. make the best decision after that. Fair enough. Um, can you think of a situation, again, in your personal or professional life where you were 100% certain you were right and you later learned that you were wrong? Yes. <laughs> okay. And how do, you, how do you deal with that? I mean, what's your kind of response to that? I typically go back to the person that I wronged and explained that I was wrong. Okay. And do you, um, do you try to apply that lesson to future behavior or do you just kind of go, eh, no big deal, I was wrong? No, I, I always try to learn from it. Okay. Um, ultimately, again, your job as a juror is to analyze this evidence, to hear the evidence, to analyze it, only the evidence that you hear in this courtroom. And at the conclusion of the case, the judge will give you the law that applies to the case. And you have to decide. You're what's called a judge of the facts, what happened, right? Um, let's assume you get this sheet of this is the law, these are the instructions we have to follow. And you read the law and you go, that can't possibly be right, or I think this law should be different. But I've got a reason, a personal belief that this law should be different. Can you follow the law as the judge instructs you, even if you think the judge is wrong, or you think the law should be changed? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to just follow up with some of your uh, questions that, and how you responded to the questionnaire. Um, again, we understand that you know this was national and international news before you received this questionnaire and that you've been exposed to some information. Um, and thank you for taking the time to fill this out. But I wanted to ask you a question about, um, there's lots of references to like a video that was made in this case. Um, and you, you watch the news or the nightly news from time to time, correct? Um, yeah, pretty rarely that I watch it. But, yeah. Okay. And, well, there, there's a video that became public, and there's actually several videos that became public. You said that you've never seen any video of the arrest of Mr. Floyd? No. Okay, not even little snippets or clips on the news? No. I saw a picture. Okay. Um, but I did not watch the video. Okay. So when you've watched the news, you may have seen like a still frame photograph that appears to be taken from a video kind of a thing? Yes. Okay. But never went and sought out or looked up this video of this arrest? No. Okay. But you have had conversations with friends and family members. Um, have your friends or family members described to you what they saw in this video? No, not really describing it, just... Um no, actually not describing it. Okay. Like, but just maybe generally talking about it, right? Um, saying that they'd seen it um, mm -hmm. and kind of the general news story that um, he was arrested and held on the ground and had a knee on him. Okay. Yeah. Um, you had heard some, in your explanation, you had heard some information about um, past incidents involving Mr. Floyd as well? Yes. All right. And you understand that Mr. Floyd's not on trial here, right? I do. Okay. And ultimately, you may or may not hear about previous involvement or previous incidents involving Mr. Floyd or Mr. Chauvin, right? But let's assume you don't hear any of that. Can you set what you may have learned aside and, again, uh, assess this case based on the evidence presented in court? Yes. Okay. And you had heard um, about two separate autopsies that you thought were performed. You wrote that you heard one coroner's report said Mr. Fly Floyd died as a result of asphyxiation. Another said it was due to drugs in his system. Yes. Okay. And again, you'll, you'll listen to various uh, testimony throughout the course of the case, and if, if that never, those issues never come up in this case, can you set aside what you thought you had heard or read and judge the case based on the evidence as it's presented in court? Yes. Um, you were asked some general impressions about both 
Mr. Chauvin as well as Mr. Floyd. Um, with respect to Mr. Chauvin, you had a neutral opinion and you wrote, I, had, I haven't heard or read or seen much of anything about the defendant. And with respect to uh, Mr. Floyd, you checked both neutral and somewhat negative and then wrote somewhere in between these. And you wrote, I am bothered by the fact that Mr. Floyd, and then you reference a prior incident or, or allegation mm -hmm. involving him. Um, but you also understood that he had served some sort of penalty or something like that. So, yes. Okay. Um, again, it's okay. Everybody forms their own opinions, right? And your opinions are as valid as mine or anyone else's. Um, can you set aside any opinions you may have formed about Mr. Floyd? And again, only analyze this case based on the evidence as presented in court. Yes. You were asked a question, the question reads, do you believe your community has been negatively or positively affected by any of the protests that have taken place in the Twin Cities area since George Floyd's death? And you wrote, I believe it has been negatively damaged. Yes. Can you explain why you think that? Well, obviously the physical damage to the city um, and seems like there's more crime um, than there was before. Um, the reputation of the city seems to have taken a hit. Okay. Um, and do you, can you see any positive things that have come out of the protests? I can't say that I'm aware of any positive things that have come out of it. Okay. It seems pretty negative right now. Sure. Um, certainly the sort of the mood of the city has changed, right? Yes. Um, one of your sons went to one of the protests, though, right? Yes. Okay. Did you have a talk conversation with him about why he did that, you know? Yes. Do you, do you agree there's a difference between a protest and a riot? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, fairly self-explanatory, right? Yes. Um, so the protest versus the riots, right? I think everyone would agree the riots had a bad, a bad uh, left a bad feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but what about the protests, the peaceful protests? Well, What's the question? Uh, well, I mean, is there anything positive that oh. comes from peaceful protests? I think there can be, sure. Okay. Do you associate the rioting with the protests? To some extent, I do. Okay. Um, do you think that everyone who protested rioted? No, I don't. Okay. Did your son riot? No, he did not. <laughs> he protested, right? He did. And, um, so if you were a juror on this case, I mean, obviously your son may have uh, a different perspective, like on the protest part of this, at least. I don't know you, I don't know your son, um, and I don't know what you've talked about. But if you were a juror in this case, and you ultimately rendered a not guilty verdict, could you go to your son and explain why you did that? I could. Okay. Would your vote be influenced because you didn't want to disappoint your son? No. Um, you've had uh, your car broken into and your son's car was stolen in the past. Yes. And you had to call the police. Yes. You indicated that you were satisfied with their response. Yes. Or very satisfied, I should say. Yes. So it's fair to say you have a, a pretty strong respect for law enforcement and things of that nature. I do. Okay. Um, and obviously this case involves a whole lot of police, right? Yes. Um, Mr. Chauvin being a police officer police officers investigating this case, police officers will testify in this case. Um, you were asked a question, and I'm going to circle back into all of that. You were asked a question that because law enforcement officers have such dangerous jobs, it is not right to second guess decisions they make while on duty. And you somewhat disagreed and then drew an arrow to strong towards strongly disagree with that. 
So knowing that the police are going to testify in this case, and uh, uh, presumably against Mr. Chauvin, as well as Mr. Chauvin being a former police officer, can you evaluate the testimony of police officers for what it is? M meaning, would you assign more trustworthiness to a police officer simply by virtue of the fact that they're a police officer? No. Okay. But you, you somewhat disagree with the proposition of questioning decisions that police officers make, right? Yes. So are there circumstances wherein a police officer's decision making is within bounds and should be questioned? It shouldn't be. Should. should. Um, I think that there's always room for questioning someone's reactions or behaviors. Um, but there, there should probably be a process that okay. that goes through. So like a more from an employment context or a, like a civilian process as opposed to a criminal process? Can you, could you read the sure. question again to me? The, it, you were, I'm going to just, there was a page where you were asked to, you were given several blanket statements yes. and you were asked to just say, I strongly agree, I sort of agree, all the way over to strongly disagree. And the, the, this statement is, because law enforcement officers have such dangerous jobs, it is not right to second guess the decisions they make on duty. And you somewhat disagreed to almost strongly disagree with that. Okay. Okay. So um, I guess the question is, are there circumstances under which it is appropriate to second guess police officers? Yes. Are. And there are, um, you recognize that there's a, a spectrum of decisions that a police officer makes on a daily basis, right? Yes. And um, sometimes those decisions are um, calculated and thought out and take some time, and other times they're very fast, right? Yes. Um, so let's assume that a police officer uh, only pulled over black drivers. Do you think it would be okay to question why that police officer is making that decision? Absolutely. Okay. Um, let's assume that a police officer was stealing drugs from the evidence room. Is it okay to question that officer's decision? Yes. Let's assume that a, a police officer is chasing a person down a dark alley, it's dark, can't see, and suddenly that person turns and faces the police officer and points something at him. Is it okay at that and the officer shoots and kills that person? Should that be also examined, that officer's decision? I, I think it should be examined. I think that it probably already is examined. Okay, fair enough. And you would agree, you strongly agreed with the statement that police in your um, community make you feel safe. Yes. Right. So again, I mean, it's fine to have a healthy respect for police officers, but would you just believe police officers simply by virtue of the fact that they're a police officer? No. You were asked a series of questions about um, both Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter, uh, and you had an, a very unfavorable opinion of Black Lives Matter. And you wrote, I do not agree with the guiding principles of the BLM movem movement. I do believe that the lives of people who happen to be black matter. So yes. can you explain, like, what, it, what do you mean by the, the guiding principles of the organization? Well, that question in particular, I mean, there, if, if that question is asking me, do I agree with the statement that black lives matter? I believe that that's a true statement. I don't believe, I don't share um, I don't agree with the, the founding principles and a lot of the positions that the organization Black Lives Matter holds to. Okay. Um, 
so because obviously there are kind of different layers of the statement black lives matter right yes. and there's there is the general sentiment, Black Lives Matter, as I'm, if I'm understanding this. Mm -hmm. There is the movement of Black Lives Matter, and then there's an organization of Black Lives Matter. Okay. Okay. And is that, is, are you suggesting that you disagree with the organization, but are in agreement with basically the movement and, and notion that Black Lives Matter? I agree with the notion that Black Lives Matter. I don't know um, how to parse out the difference between the movement and the organization. Okay, fair enough. Um, with respect to Blue Lives Matter, you had a neutral opinion and you wrote, I don't know anything about that organization, but like my answer above, I believe that the lives of people who are police officers matter. Correct. So it's kind of the general sentiment that everybody matters. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, you have a, a relative who was a sheriff uh, in the past, yes. some time ago. Yes. Is that person still alive and with us? Yes. Okay. So if you were a juror on this case, would you call your relative and say, uh, hey, um, this is what they're telling me about how police officers are trained or what you're supposed to do. Can you confer Would you call that person for advice? No. Similarly, you have some friends who are in the medical profession um, in various varying degrees. Um, would you call them for medical advice if you were a juror? No. I was um, interested in one of you were asked a series of questions and um, about the criminal justice system generally, and I was interested in one of your responses. You were asked do you believe our criminal justice system works? Why or why not? And you wrote, I am not certain I understand this question properly, but I believe we have a system that, when it works correctly, is a fair and just system. I do understand that there could be instances when defendants do not receive adequate representation or sentencing guidelines may not be considered just. No system is perfect. I do think, in the main, that our justice system works. So the, the notion that when it doesn't work is because of an inadequacy of representation for individuals accused of crimes, is that where you think is a problem in the system? I think that's one problem in the system. Right. A, a reason to fully fund, say, the public defender's office, right? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Um, the, uh, and then also just in terms of the disparity in sentencing, is that what you mean by the sentencing guidelines may not be considered just? Yes. Okay. Um, ultimately you understand that I'm a lawyer, I represent my client, these are lawyers, they represent their client, um, and we're all trying to do the best we can do, right? Yes. Now, you were asked a question, the last question you were asked is, do you want to serve as a juror on this case? And you checked the box, not sure. Right? And you wrote, this trial, like the events that led to it, will be well publicized and followed by many people. The unrest, burning, and looting following Mr. Floyd's death was troubling. It would be naive to think that similar things couldn't happen depending on the outcome of the trial. I am not sure if it is warranted, but I could have concerns about my privacy and safety. So the, that's yes. that same notion that we started up our conversation with. Right? Yes. Um, knowing what you know now, a couple months later, um, do you feel that you would be a fair and impartial juror in this case? Yes. Could you set aside your concerns about privacy and safety and listen to the evidence and judge this case based on the evidence. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, may I have a moment? Yeah.
We'll pass for cause, Your Honor. Mr. Slusher. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, juror number 87, good morning. We've been at it for a while uh, and have been patient, and we thank you for that. Uh, I do want to follow up on uh, a couple of your responses. And in, in one um, instance, I believe you responded on the survey that you believe uh, somewhat agree with the proposition that discrimination is not as bad as the media uh, uh, says that it is. Do you recall that response? I don't, but... <laughs> Does that sound consistent with your belief that you somewhat agree that the media maybe uh, overblows uh, discrimination or exaggerates it? Yes. Okay. So the, the two parts of that. First, uh, what, what do you believe the media says about discrimination? Well, by saying that, I feel like they exaggerate it. I feel like the media exaggerates a lot of things. So I don't know that it would be necessarily more than other things that they exaggerate, but um, I feel like they may push it to a degree that stirs up controversy. Okay. And is that what you're looking for as an answer? <laughs> I'm just looking for your answer. Well, I, I know. Yeah. I meant to, did it answer your question? It did. It did. But, but of course, now I'll have to follow, okay. <laughs> follow up. Um, uh, but in that, do you, why do you think uh, the media does that? I think they're they're not as biased, unbiased as they always claim that they are. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that would be my answer. Okay. And are there uh, particular stories or instances that you can think of that you thought, you know, the media is really kind of overplaying or overselling uh, discrimination, or is it more of a generalized? feeling you get from, from watching the news or, or reading the paper? More of a generalized feeling. Okay. Now, I'd like to compare that generalized feeling with some of your own real life experience in, in how you would make that determination. So have you had um, conversations with uh, close friends or family members who have experienced uh, discrimination in their mm -hmm. life? Have I had them? Yes. Just in, in what areas? Any area? Any area. Um, I'm sure I have, but I can't think of any off the top of my head. How about taking it from the more general to the specific, okay. specific racial discrimination? Have you had conversations with friends of yours who have <laughs> talked to you about racial discrimination that they may have experienced? Yes. And. How have those conversations, I guess, compared with what you've seen on TV or read in the paper regarding um, the media's depiction of discrimination? Well, you know, when you're speaking with one person, you're getting more of a personal story behind it. And so when you have those kinds of facts, it's a little um, easier to understand the discrimination than just a, a blanket discrimination story or something like that that you might see. So it sounds like you would be more inclined to believe something, a more personal story, than you would just kind of a generalized story that you would see in the media. Yes. Can you share with us, without revealing you know, who this person would be, just what conversations have you had with friends who've experienced discrimination? What, what kind of discrimination have they shared with you? Um, 
being looked at suspiciously, um, being categorized in certain ways. Um, being treated um, as somehow less than other people. It's hard to hear those uh, mm -hmm. experiences, isn't it? It is. You indicated in, in your survey that the criminal justice system, uh, in, in response to the question whether the criminal justice system is biased against racial and ethnic minorities, you indicated that you somewhat disagree with that proposition. And I'd like you to, to share with us a little bit you know, why you somewhat disagree with that proposition. Well. I think when I answered that question, I was looking at it as um, how the system should work and that we have a, a legal system that should be, that should work fairly for everyone. So I don't believe the system has been written in to be discriminatory. As opposed to maybe, um, in practice, how it can work out for some people. Uh, so think of the, your friend who shared with you the, the view that, from, from your friend's perception, they were put in a certain category mm -hmm. or viewed suspiciously that maybe someone else in the same situation would not have been. Mm -hmm. Do you think that can bleed into the criminal justice system? After all, we are all, all human beings here. Sure. Yes. So would you then uh, agree that the criminal justice system can be biased against racial and ethnic minorities? I believe it could be in, in instances, sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would agree that it is a, as a blanket statement, but mm -hmm. yes. You indicated that you um, and, and uh, a bit of a rarity I have not seen the video uh, that we were talking about earlier, but you did recall seeing an image uh, from from the video. Is that right? I'm assuming it's from the video. Um, it was just a, a still picture, and I, I think I saw it on a news website. Do you recall what that still picture showed? It showed um, police officer. I don't think I saw Mr. Floyd. Um, I believe there was maybe a car on the edge of the, the picture. And that's all I can remember seeing. Okay. Uh, you indicated that you had an uncle who worked for about two decades uh, in a fairly large department. We won't identify which one it was. Uh, is that right? As a, as a deputy sheriff? Yes. Yes. Are you close with your uncle? Um, not super close. Okay. Did, did you ever speak uh, with your uncle about his line of work? I'm sure I did over the years, yeah. Has he ever shared stories with you uh, about you know, just work-related stories? Uh-huh, yes. Can, can you recall any uh, particular instances? Usually when an officer will share a story with somebody, it won't be about the time nothing happened, right? Right. Um, he shared, he served um, papers, so he shared a couple stories with me where people did not react well to being served papers. Um, right. And one story of being I believe he was bit in the jail by a, somebody in jail. But that's really all I can remember him talking about. 
sounds like a, a, a pretty difficult job and uh, one's line of work you don't expect to get uh, bitten by people. Sure. Right. And you also indicated that you do have a, a strong uh, trust in police officers, is that right? Yes. And, and you did state in response to uh, counsel's question that you believe that you could evaluate the testimony of uh, a police officer in the same light as a non-police officer? Yes. But I need to ask you, if you were, uh, say, walking down the street and you were looking for a particular place, say the IDS Center, you didn't know where it was, and there were two people, and one was a police officer and one was a bystander. And the police officer told you that the IDS center was to the left, and the bystander told you that the IDS center was actually to the right. Uh, which, which direction would you follow? <laughs> um, probably the police officer's direction, I would assume, if he worked for the city, he would know. And, you know, and why is that? Why do you think you would follow the police officer's direction? Um, because I guess I would assume that he would have had that question before, that he would have directed people in the city before. And so based on that experience, you believe that the officer would be reliable, at least in terms of directions? Yes. Um, as opposed to the bystander, what would you question about the bystander's directions? If I know nothing other than he's a bystander, I don't know that they're from the city, I don't know their background, I wouldn't assume that they knew more than the police officer knew. I, I wanted to follow up with you. You indicated that your son did go to a, a protest. Yes. Did you talk to your son about going to the protest? Um, after, when I found out that he had gone. Okay. This wasn't something he shared with you before? No. So, Mom, I'm going to a protest. No, and... <laughs> he did not. Okay. Uh, um, what was your reaction when you found out that your son went to this protest, hadn't told you about it, found out after the fact? He was at, he was on the 35W bridge when the truck came through, so my reaction was that I was very frightened when he called and told me that. Okay. Uh, I recall that story. Uh, what did he tell you about it? Well, he just told me he was on the bridge, that the truck came, that everybody ran. So. Were you upset with him for attending the protest uh, in the first place? Or was it more that you were upset uh, finding out, I would imagine, about the, the truck incident on the 35th? I was upset about the truck incident. I, um, I, was, I wasn't angry with him for going. I was more concerned for his safety. Okay. Um, one moment, Your Honor. Thank you very much, and thank you, ma'am, for your answers. Uh, Your Honor, the state will exercise a preemptory. And jury 87, uh, you're excused from this panel, so you won't have to serve on the jury. And in fact, you're excused from all jury service for now, uh, unless we send you a summons in the future. Uh, you don't have to worry about being called about a different case during this term. Okay. So uh, the deputy will escort you out and take some paperwork from you, and okay. we'll go from there. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I've lost track. What number was that for the state? I'm sorry, it was what number strike? It was your sixth strike. Okay. So you have four left. Got it. Uh, before we bring the next, is the next year coming? 
Okay. Do not water. Um, yeah, can you hold on? Just hold them in the hallway. I just want council to be aware of something. Just so that council is aware, uh, a variety of members of the media have been asking for more information about JERS or when it's going to be public, pressing us for a little more detail. And I've been emailing with the chief judge about that, and it's being communicated to the media, so I think you should be aware of what's being communicated to the media and even incorporated in your voir dire if you wish. And that specifically is that uh, nothing is going, we are currently releasing the race and the age decade of seated jurors. Everything else, because we have an anonymous jury, is remaining confidential. It is not being released publicly. When it will be released publicly is up to the court, and I have told Judge Barnett that I will order the release of the questionnaires and identifying information a name, not an address, perhaps a single uh, contact method, email, text, whatever, uh, when I deem it safe to do so. That will be based mostly, as you all know, judges are very protective of our jurors. When I feel it is safe for the jurors, I will release their information, not before. And so uh, if you want to incorporate that, that it's basically the, the court's decision to when to release such information, and the court will do so when it determines that it is safe to do so. So, because I know, Mr. Nelson, you've kind of tried to bring it up without saying what the court's going to do. I think if you, you can repeat that to the jurors, so, and of course that doesn't give anybody a date certain. It's my uh, evaluation of the current situation and at the time when a release is requested or on my own motion, it will be released when I deem it safe to do so. So, you may uh, voir dire on that issue as well using the court standard that has now been communicated to the media. All right, let's bring our next juror in, which is juror number 88. 